And we're going to begin reading today in verse 7, or verse 14, I'm sorry, of chapter 7. And this is Paul the Apostle, and he is writing about a very real struggle that he feels as a human being. And as you read these words from Paul, every time I read them from Paul, I think about this man of faith. I think about this man who traveled the world and planted churches and preached and saw God do amazing things in his life. And then you read passages like this, and it shows you that we all truly are cut from the same cloth. And as Paul is writing to us, he knows the human condition very, very well. And so here are the words from Paul today in Romans chapter 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my members, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. A few years ago I had a job interview, and one of the questions on the job interview was, On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your patience? (sighs) Immediately, I wanted to say a 1. But I knew, you know, you can't say that in a job interview. They don't want someone that's a 1 on the scale of patience. So I thought some more. And, you know, as as your mind is processing things fast, and you know you can't say a 9 or a 10 because nobody is truly a 9 or a 10 in patience. So I thought, well, maybe I could bring it down to just above passing, you know, maybe like a C or a D average, you know. So I said, well, I don't want to brag, but um, I'm a 26 and a 7. And he said, how about we say a 7 to 8? I said, well, from your lips to God's ears, okay? <laughs> that was a real interaction with a guy, and I don't know why he wanted to be a 7 or 8. Maybe there was a requirement that they only hire people that are at least a 7 or above on the patient scale, but anyways... Um, What is it about the human nature that makes patience seem like an extinct dinosaur? You know, you think, oh, patience, yeah, uh, that was that uh, one guy, he had that long time ago, but haven't seen patience around since then. Maybe it was an old wooden ship, the RMS Patience, who years ago sailed the seven seas and is long lost. You know, when we think of this idea of patience, I like to break things down a little bit. Patience implies that we are waiting on something, waiting to arrive somewhere. As Brad Paisley puts it in his song, waiting on a woman, which uh, really isn't always a bad thing. Waiting for the server to give us our food, waiting for the dog days of summer to end so we can get to the football season, waiting for the mechanic to let us know when the car is ready, waiting to hear back from that prospective employer waiting to hear test results from a doctor, waiting for a loved one to no longer be in pain and to finally be at rest. Waiting, suspended between two points. You haven't be, you've begun a journey, but you're no longer at the beginning and you haven't quite reached the destination. 
And so it's in this in-between existence that we as humans so often find ourselves in, this human experience that we just plain do not like waiting. We don't like the in-between moments of waiting for something between two points, between point A and point B. We're just simply not comfortable doing it. We want to find an end. We want to get to a conclusion or at least go back to the very beginning so we're not waiting out in open space. I remember a couple years ago we were going to fly up to Indiana to finish my master's degree and we had to go to the Austin airport and we got a late start that morning and we had just barely gotten through security and our plane was, it was getting ready to, to take off and so we rushed to our gate and uh, you know I'm just huffing and puffing and I, I'm, I pride myself on being someone that's usually punctual and a lot of times five or ten minutes early and and uh, so you know we kind of pull up and I'm just like oh good we're not gonna miss our flight our travel plans aren't gonna be delayed you know I'm, I'm very a big stickler on everything going according to time according to schedule and so we get to the gate and I'm like oh yes and they're like okay you can go ahead and board and so I'm just I'm like Okay, we, we boarded our plane. We're on our way. We're gonna we're gonna be in Indiana, you know, around sometime in the afternoon. And and uh, so we fly up to Dallas, and there were storms all over in Dallas. And we get there, and they start canceling flights left and right. And so I'm like, uh, and Eliana was just about a year old, and and just she actually started walking on that trip. And uh, so we're waiting in the airport, and we're waiting and waiting. And they finally they say, okay, all flights are canceled, and you're fly you're gonna have to wait the night. You're, we're gonna put you in a hotel. And uh, so we, you know, I stood in line for about an hour waiting to talk to the service representative. And, and I remember thinking while I was waiting in line, thinking, man, if only we wouldn't have gotten on that plane in Austin. If only we would have missed the plane in Austin and we wouldn't be waiting in no man's land. Now, I'd rather be sleeping in my own bed tonight than going and getting a hotel. And, you know, we didn't have our bags with us. And, you know, those of you that travel and have been through that, it's a very unsettling thing. And so I thought instead of being in the middle of these two points, can I at least just go back to the beginning so we could just not make this trip? We all, as humans, we've got things to do. We've got places to be. We've got people to see. And we imagine ourselves more important than the in-between moments when nothing significant is happening. Our secular culture ingrains this in us as we think about, okay, the 4th of July is now over, so what's going into the stores now? Back to school stuff. And so all of the teachers and the students are like, can we get just a few more weeks without a reminder that it's time to go back to school? And the parents are like, yes, yes, send them back to school. <laughs> back to school happens. And after that, we begin to see fall merchandise in the stores, reminding us that Halloween and Thanksgiving are on their way. And we rush ahead to cooler weather to football season, to pumpkin spice, lattes, to fall festivals and Thanksgiving. And before Christmas comes, or before Thanksgiving comes, Christmas begins to creep in, and rightfully so. As soon as Hobby Lobby puts out their Christmas section, I will be officing in there from that time on, so that's where you can find me. We go from one celebration to the next. There's no in-between. It's just one celebration to the next, one moment to the next. New Year's and Super Bowl and Valentine's and Easter and round and round and round the circle goes. And we blame it on the stores. We blame it on the advertisers who put all those things up in the stores. But if we're honest, we would say that we find a lot of comfort in this. Because the in-betweens, the Junes, the Septembers, the Januaries, leave us feeling empty in this life. You could say that the in-between times of life, whether waiting for a celebration or waiting in traffic, waiting to get to your destination or waiting for anything else, leaves us feeling vulnerable. Any kind of wait leaves us feeling vulnerable. The distractions from all the noise and the movement in our world that comforts us and gives us something else to focus on besides the brokenness that we live with on a day-to-day -day basis. Things get very real, things get very raw, things get very honest, and truth confronts us in these in-between moments of waiting, those moments of silence, those in-between moments on the journey that we call life, that we're so eager to push back and get to the next significant moment or celebration. 
been reading a book from an Anglican pastor who was, up until a few weeks ago, she was in Austin. She's since moved to Pittsburgh, but she wrote a book called The Liturgy of the Ordinary, and she talks about finding a rhythm to our day that reminds us of the presence of Christ. And if you'll think back a few weeks ago, I had a message on practicing the presence of God and remembering he's with us all the time. And this is one of the things that she said in her book. She says, Christians are people who wait. We live in liminal time. In the already, but not yet. Christ has come, and he will come again. We dwell in the meantime. We wait. The already and not yet. That's our existence. That's our story as Christians. And she goes on to say in the book, she says, We live between the D-Day and the V-Day. The victory is secured, but the battle rages on for a little bit longer. And as Christians... We struggle to live in this tension between D-Day and V-Day. The in-between as we face as, as we face the reality that we are born of the Spirit, yet we walk in flesh in this earth, and we await that final resurrection. Until that final resurrection comes, there's that in-between waiting, that tension between being born of the Spirit and living in fleshly bodies. This passage from Romans chapter 7 that I read this morning, it details Paul's struggle, it details our struggle of this in-between time of life. We find ourselves like Paul on this journey towards Christ-likeness. That's the journey that we're all on. And along the way, we experience pit stops, road construction. Oh, you love road construction. If you go through Oklahoma right now, there's like a thousand bridges out on 35. You have traffic jams, motion sickness, and poor cell reception. <laughs> On this journey to Christ's likeness, those in-between moments between D-Day and V-Day, we experience these problems, these struggles, these failures. And the words, are we there yet, continually ring out from the back of our mind. And instead of celebrating that we are on the way, we get frustrated that we aren't there yet. Isn't that the truth of us? Instead of celebrating that the wheels are in motion and that we're somewhere on the way, that we've started the journey, we get frustrated and, and upset and we lament that we haven't reached the destination just yet. Paul says it like this, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law that's at work in me, waging war against my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am, Paul says. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Who will bring me to victory? Could it be that our problem with patience in this life isn't that it goes much deeper than we're conditioned by our culture? You know, sometimes we blame our lack of patience on, well, it's, you know, we got the microwave and we've got these restaurants that promised, a, you know, a fast, you know, drive-through experience. You know, could it be more than just what our culture has brought to us? But could it be that we have an issue with patience and waiting because there is this cry within our heart? In our human existence that we say with Paul, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? We find ourselves in that middle area, that middle ground between D-Day and V-Day. And we cry out and say, what's to become of me? What's going to happen to me? And it's in the midst of our hurry and trying to preoccupy our minds with things so that we don't have to dwell on our brokenness. That we are reminded today that salvation isn't found at the end of the journey, but it's to be found on the road that we are on. At mile marker, middle of nowhere, on this journey between flesh and spirit, we are reminded, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I remember driving to New Mexico last year and I hit this stretch that I'm glad that I had enough gas in the tank 
because I knew if I would run out, it would be a long time before I saw another car. And I remember just enjoying the scenery and, and stopping the car in the middle of the road and I could see as far as the eye could see one direction and as far as the eye can see in the other direction. So I just stopped the car in the middle of the road and I stood in the middle of the road. And I wasn't quite to my destination. I had about another four or five hours to get there and I was really looking forward to getting to my mountain lodge. But it was in that moment, that middle of nowhere moment, where maybe there was a buzzard hopping around looking for a rat to eat and seeing kind of the waves of heat out there on the hit in the road and thinking, what a beautiful place this is. What a beautiful place. And I remember having just a wonderful moment of talking. To, I felt like I was the only person in the world. <laughs> I was probably the only person in that county, whatever it was in New Mexico, but it was a beautiful time of reminding myself that in this in-between that God is with me. And it may not be the end point, but that's not the point. The point is to continue through this middle part of life, the fluff part, of the dash between the two dates that we see on someone's tombstone. That we are fellow travelers with Christ on the road. And so because of what Christ has done, as Paul tells us, that there's now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, that right now, you and I, we are not subject to the law of sin and death. Even though we still struggle, we are not subject to that, but rather the law of the Spirit who gives us life in the everyday, in the journey from here to there, to enjoy the fellowship of God with us, even in our brokenness. That even as we could say with Paul, you know, the, the good that I want to do, a lot of times I don't do. But it's even in that, that Paul says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And when we view life through this lens, it's so much more joyful. We can slow down and we can enjoy this journey of life. We can celebrate that we are on our way instead of needing to rush to the end point, to rush to our destination. And it's amazing what happens when we slow down. We notice new buildings. It's, it's amazing going on the stretch from Bastrop to Austin when you take the time to look and see what's around, what businesses exist, what kind of interesting things are there that you have never seen in the years of traveling up and down a particular road. When we slow down and we enjoy this middle part of life, this existence, we have the chance to see others who are stranded. Others who ran out of gas. Others who had a blowout. And then we can be a living example of the parable of the Good Samaritan. We've got time to stop. Where else are we going? We've got time to stop to get someone else back up on the road again. We will slow down and enjoy the, the waiting. And see opportunities that God may put before us to help someone else get back up on the road again. And friends, if we keep this perspective in mind, then we can move forward down the road and let's say a detour comes your way. The detour isn't the end of the road. It's not the end of the world, but it's an opportunity for each and every one of us to put our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul says, but he said to me, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in weakness. In the weakness and the waiting and the in-between existence, the grace of God is sufficient for you. And his power is there to lift you up and to give you strength to please him and do his will in this earth. So friends, be still and know that he is God. And remember that all of those who wait, all of those who hope in the Lord, they will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So friends, as we find ourselves in this dash between two numbers of life, we have times of waiting and slowing down. Praise God for his presence with you and find opportunities in the slowing down this week to be good news, be the good news of the gospel to someone else. It's in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.